Okay, welcome to my show, Coronavirus Update by Hirav. Yes, today is a celebration of Star Wars Day. And I'm my uh, flaming sword. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, so welcome to a coronavirus update uh, for May 4, 2020. Um, besides the fact that it's a Star Wars Day, um, it's also International Respect for Chicken Day. And that's the one I really like. So, so you see the photo of all the chicken there. <laughs> International Respect for Chickens Day. I love chicken. I love all kinds of chicken. Baked chicken, fried chicken, um, oven baked chicken, charbroiled chicken, barbecue chicken. So I have tremendous amount of respect for chicken. Who gives me so much joy? <laughs> you know, all the food and oh my gosh, where where would this country be without chicken? And also, I I tip my hat to you, all the firemen uh, in the DMV area. And when we say DMV, uh, we are referring to uh, D stands for District of Columbia. M stands for Maryland, and um, V stands for Virginia. So we talk about VMV, and we're just kind of talking about this tri-state area with the focus uh, in Washington, D.C. Uh, Senate started today uh, their session. We started their session, and many of the senators and senator staff are live in either Washington, D.C., or Maryland, or Virginia. And that's why uh, this concept of DMV is kind of significant. And uh, so I uh, tip my hat to you, all the firemen in Washington, D.C., Maryland, uh, and Virginia. And uh, I sent out uh, uh, congratulations for uh, International Firemen's Day to uh, District, uh, Virginia's 8th District Fire Department, Arlington Alexandra Falls Church, and Fairfax County uh, with my tweet earlier on. Uh, so uh, we appreciate all the things that you do uh, for our Virginia State District. Uh, you saved a lot of lives and um, uh, you know, we, we appreciate you. Uh, all of us in Virginia State District appreciate you. So yeah, so happy Fireman's Day, happy uh, Star Wars Day, and happy Chicken Day. Uh, so, yeah, we're celebrating a lot of holidays today. <laughs> so, we're in a festive mood. Um, let's go to uh, the daily COVID figures. Uh, we have about the same number of deaths as yesterday. Um, and so, it's 1,248. Um, and yesterday, it was around 1,300 as well. Um, maybe this is a new normal. I'm optimistic, but cautiously optimistic. Um, so let's see, you know, what kind of figures we have tomorrow and day after tomorrow. Uh, but yeah, so I'm cautiously optimistic. Uh, but still, you know, it's a lot of numbers, you know, 1,248, that's no joke. Uh, so yesterday we had um, 67,674 um, uh, Americans uh, dead. Uh, and we added 1,248 uh, over the 24-hour period, and now we have uh, 68,922 Americans dead, which is very, very unfortunate. Um, and we're headed toward Memorial Day and end of uh, May, and we generally remember the fallen uh, in wars, soldiers, but I mean, this year, you know, uh, there's so many Americans who died from COVID, um, you know, uh, maybe we'll have an opportunity to kind of remember them. There's so many, it's hard to kind of remember every single one of them. They're just kind of becoming numbers, which is unfortunate. Um, we have uh, 1,157,753 uh, confirmed cases uh, of um, COVID-19. Uh, 
um, yesterday and today, 24 hours later, it's risen, you know, um, uh, almost 30,000. It's generally been around 20,000 to 30,000 new cases per day. Uh, and our new figures are 1,180, um, well, I mean, 1,180,332. So that's we are. Uh, so we have uh, 1,248 deaths uh, in the last 24 hours. And, um, you know, I said, you know, I'm cautiously optimistic, but, um, you know, it seems like we're getting better because we used to have like 3,000 or more deaths, and now we're at 1,248. During Holy Week, we had like average of 2,000 every day, but it's still very, very high. So, you know, it's nothing to be really happy about because a lot of Americans are dying. Um, did you, by the way, see a Lion King? I saw the musical when I was in, um, in uh, in England, um, and um, you know, I guess the storyline is like uh, there's an evil uncle, uh, and um, the lion, the Lion King, uh, you know, is about to be killed by the evil uncle, um, and then you know we have a happy ending. Um, you know, I um, you know, I, I mentioned that because you know. Um, and we're going to talk about England today. And so I'm feeling a little nostalgic about England. I, I loved um, all the theater in uh, London, uh, West End. Um, and I like London far more than New York for theater scene because it's a smaller city and it's, it's cozier. It feels more like a, a town than a city in most areas uh, of New York does. I mean, um, London does. Uh, and that's one of the reasons I really like Washington, D.C. kind of feels like a town. It's kind of big rather than like a big city. Uh, when I was um, in New York area, I remember buildings were really, really tall and everybody's just like crunched in there like sardines. Uh, and I was like, wow, this is horrible. I, I really didn't like living in New York area. And that's why I am in Washington, D.C. area. And I love this area. So. Vote for me for U.S. Congress for Virginia's 8th District on November 3rd, 2020. I'm running as an independent uh, against the current congressman, uh, Don Beyer, who's a Democrat. Uh, I believe I could do a far better job. I'm more fun. I'm more fun-loving. I will entertain you more. <laughs> also, I will be a better leader uh, and take care of you better. So vote for me over Don uh, on November 3rd, 2020, general election. Virginia's 8th District. I mean, Don's a nice guy. I met him. You know, I, I like him. But I just think I could do a better job. So vote for me. Uh, everyone who voted for Don last election or several election cycles, you still you can vote for me. You need a better leader. You deserve me. You deserve a better leader. But anyway, um, yeah, I, I was just trying to kind of, uh, you know, bring the tension down with the Lion King. Because it, it is a little bit sad. I mean, it's really sad. And, you know, as Americans, you know, we're becoming almost normalized into looking at thousands or more Americans dying every day, and it's not normal. Um, and, uh, you know, in my show, I compare the current situation of America with situation of, of other countries around the world, how they're experiencing COVID, and that's what sets my show apart from other shows that you see. Uh, and I bring insight that is kind of like looking at the trees, excuse me, looking at the trees inside a forest. So we look at the forest as well. And most uh, TV shows like CNN and BBC and Sky News and France 24, they just look at the trees and you get a really kind of like tunnel vision, like a myopic tunnel vision uh, of what's going on because your little pond is not your reality. Um, and uh, I don't know if you have had a, ever had a bias training. Everybody in the world has a, has a bias of some kind, uh, but they don't recognize it. There's a blind spot and we call that uh, Johari Square, you know, or Johari Square discusses that, that every human being has a blind spot that they don't see that for themselves. Uh, and that is their like implicit bias, meaning they have a bias, but they don't, 
acknowledge that they have a bias. It's kind of like what I say about liberal progressives. I honestly think liberal progressives are the most racist people in the world. That's my feeling and that's been my experience just working with uh, liberal progressives. They're just like really racist, you know, they hide behind their political correctness talk, but the way they treat African Americans, uh, Asians, Hispanics, who don't agree with their views, um, you know, it's clearly racist, you know, and so I've seen uh, evangelical Christians uh, who are, you know, uh, Chinese or, or African American or or Bible bling Catholics who oppose gay marriage and abortion, uh, who are Hispanic, you know, from Mexico or, or um, you know, Chile, be mistreated by liberal progressives, you know, like they were treated like third. So, I mean, for me, I mean, when I think of liberal progressives, I think of them as like racist, intolerant racist, uh, you know, who are ideologically driven. But that's been my empirical observation, like what I've seen around the, the world. Um, and, you know, so it's based on my experience of, of working with liberal progressives. Um, and I, I've been in liberal progressive setting all my life. I mean, since graduating from uh, a Christian school, film and Christian Academy, uh, I went to University of Pennsylvania and Ivy League University, which is a very liberal progressive university. And I've basically been all just in that kind of setting. That's like my pond, liberal progressive uh you know areas are like my pond i went to ucla for phd i um did research and uh uh at harvard uh brown university cambridge university in england and we're going to talk about cambridge a little bit today um you know and uh you know i'm just you know heidelberg university in germany uh so you know that this is like my pond liberal progressive environment is my pond that's the one that i feel most comfortable in because that's my pond that's where i am and all my friends have been liberal progressives like you know i don't know any republicans really i mean i made some republican friends in the arlington alexandria falls church and fairfax county republican committees once i started going to the, their meetings when i decided to run for u.s congress i was originally wanted to run as a Republican candidate, I still want to, but I I did not raise enough money by the deadline, the filing deadline for Republican front primaries. And we had to file with the Republican committee, uh, Virginia's eighth district committee. And they asked for a lot of money. And you know, uh, none of the candidates raised that kind of money by that time, from what I understand. And that's like Jeff Jordan and um um Oh my gosh, who's my friend's name? I can't remember. I can't. I can't believe I forgot his name. Jeff Jordan and uh, uh Mark Elmore. Uh, so uh, yeah, they're they're nice guys, you know. Uh, uh, and so I don't think any of us raised uh, any money in terms of donation by the time we had to like pay the filing fee. But I think like Mark Elmore and uh, Jeff Jordan, I think they paid from their own pockets. I don't know, you know. Uh, but um. Uh, you know, I, I wasn't have to pay out of my pocket because I'm in a master's program at School of Nursing and Health Studies. And I'm graduating in uh, 2020 summer. Yay! <laughs> I'm graduating with my cohort members uh, uh, in Clinical Nurse Leader Program. That's the official name of our program is Clinical Nurse Leader. So we are trained to become clinical nurse leaders. So, so we will be certified as clinical nurse leaders uh, after we graduate and, and take our certificate exam and that's scheduled for August. And generally all of us pass because Georgetown University has a very good program. It's 100% pass. Um, so yeah, so that's my program. Uh, and so I'm borrowing $100,000 per year. So in two years that I was a full-time uh, master's student uh, at the School of Nursing and Health Study with focus on clinical nurse leader, I borrowed two hundred thousand dollars, and you know several of my my core members, um, you know, have done that too. Um, and so, um, yeah, I mean, it's a it's a large investment. Obviously, I'm doing that because I want to save lives as a clinical nurse leader. So I feel it's worth borrowing all that money. Uh, it's like a price of a house in Pennsylvania. I could buy a house for like hundred hundred thousand. <laughs> so. Well, Philadelphia where I grew up. I mean, less than that. I mean, in the city of Philadelphia, you could buy a house for like 70000 
maybe not a single home, but you could definitely find a single home for a hundred thousand somewhere. So you like just like paying uh, two hundred thousand dollars for a two-year master's program just sounds like a lot, but you know, for me, saving human life is worth it. Um, that's why I did it. And um, I've shared uh, before the reason that I decided to run for U.S. Congress is um, I've had inspiration uh, from teachers of mine in the nursing school, uh, chief of which is uh, Professor uh, Lorraine Spencer. She's an expert in public health nursing. Uh, she's, um, she, she's been my uh, academic advisor since the very beginning um, when I started at Georgetown. And uh, she's an expert in public health nursing. Uh, she served as a school nurse at uh, Wakefield High School, which is like a mile away from here. I taught there during summer school, like ESL, English as second language and math. Um, and I shared that um, in previous episodes, so you can watch, catch up on the episodes if you want. And then, you know, she played leadership role in Arlington uh, County Public Health Department. Uh, and so she's been inspirational. You know, she's a uh, like clinical instructor uh, in public health nursing, and I learned so much from her. Uh, she's amazing. Uh, and also, like, she, she uh, gave us lectures on public health nursing, uh, uh, and uh, she taught so much. And, um, you know, I had my lecture part in the fall, and she taught that um, uh, with Erin Mon, who's like a national leader in school nursing. Uh, so everybody in school nursing knows Erin Mon. Uh, so uh, Professor Aaron Mon and uh, Professor Lawrence Spencer taught the class, you know, and uh, you know they were talking about the pyramid downstream, upstream, and they were saying the most effective way to help everybody achieve uh, health is by creating policy changes at the legislature level. Uh, so I actually took a class um, uh, this semester uh, on policy and um, and it was taught by Lauren in Professor Lauren Inouye uh, who worked with uh, AACN uh, as a lobbyist I guess in Washington DC trying to get more funding for the, the field of nursing and she's great I mean she she uh, she organized all the details about you know how how it works in Washington DC policy what lobbying, I guess they call it advocacy, how that works and uh, what, what the nursing profession has done. Um, you know, and so I learned a lot from her and we had some, you know, projects which were uh, kind of, um, uh, you know, down to earth, usable, you know, things like writing a one pager. Uh, and I think I posted my one pager on my Twitter account from that class, <laughs> you know, uh, so uh, you could have a look at that. Um, yeah, see, we, we learn things that we can use, so I use them. Um, but yeah, so uh, I shared with her, I'm running for uh, U.S. Congress in Virginia's 8th District, and she was really excited about that, too. Uh, so, you know, my, uh, my nursing professors at Georgetown uh, are very supportive of me, so once I become a U.S. Congressman, I'm going to invite them and try to do more things with them uh, in the area of public health, and uh, not just public health, but just kind of all kind of health areas. Um, and I like to bring like a lot of legislation that's gonna help everybody uh, achieve uh, wellness and health. Uh, and I you know, thought about some, some things that I wanna do right away, uh, because I think there are things we can do for American citizens that will help them and also reduce costs. So I have some really good ideas. And so, um, and I like to work with AACN obviously and, 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 and NLN and other nursing organization, um, AAN. Um, and so, you know, uh, and also obviously American Medical Association and, and other, other um, health related groups. Uh, I'm also a phlebotomist, a certified phlebotomist. I have a national certificate. I've been a certified phlebotomist for, uh, for a while. Um, but uh, yeah, so, you know, bring in the phlebotomist, um, <laughs> you know, just, uh, you know, all kinds of uh, professional organizations in healthcare, you know. Um, you know, and work together to kind of improve our healthcare system. Uh, and so, uh, you know, uh, but the person who actually got me to really seriously consider running for U.S. Congress is Professor Lorraine Spencer. Uh, her class was revolutionary, it just kind of 
uh, you know, revolutionized the way I thought about things, you know, and so I decided to run for U.S. Congress and told her that. Uh, she was very happy for me. Uh, and um, yeah, so I'm hoping to win in, um, you know, November 3rd, 2020 against Mr. Don Byer, um, her and the U.S. Congressman. And uh, once I get to uh, Congress, I'll do a lot of good stuff for you. So <laughs> vote for me. Yeah. So uh, you can visit my uh, website at www.hirakforcongress.com. That's right there on your board um, you know, that you can see. Uh, so you can visit and, and check out my blogs. <laughs> I have some interesting blogs there. And uh, all the things that I want to do to improve society. Um, so you can see uh, my credentials and the fact that I am the Leonardo da Vinci of 21st century because more and more visible to you. <laughs> yeah, so, um, but you know, now, uh, you know, um, so I, that's why I couldn't pay for the filing fee for uh, Republican, well, we, we don't have primaries, we, ha we have a convention, so we have to file the fee with the Republican Virginia's 8th district. And then in the convention, the delegates decide uh, so I really wanted to do that, but uh, you know, when you don't have any money, you don't have any money. <laughs> so at the end of this uh, program, you could click on my appeal to uh, appeal at the Arlington uh, Republican Party Committee uh, in a meeting in, in February and see my appeal. So my earnest appeal. And so I'm running as an independent. I see that as God's will. You know, I, it's not the way I plan it, planned it. Uh, but you know, the Bible says, you know, um, you know, man can decide. Man can plan his ways, but the one who determines his path is the Lord. So I just trust God, you know. I wanted to re run as a Republican. Um, then I, I would have um, been at the Republican convention with uh, Mark Elmore and Jeff Jordan, and we would have, uh, you know, duked it out. <laughs> I, I, I believe I would have come out on top, but, you know, <laughs> that's, you know, I, I guess they, they all think that too. <laughs> But um, yeah, but you know, as, as things happen, you know, uh, God has guided me to run as an independent and I'm just embracing that. Uh, may the force be with you or with me. <laughs> so, you know, I'm embracing it and I'm, you know, I'm running, um, you know, for that. And uh, uh, so, you know, I, you know I, I think, you know, the Virginia election board is kind of giving me a hard time. I sent them like three different letters uh, about my candidacy and, I haven't received any letter back. So I don't know if it's, his, if it's Virginia Governor Northam who, who dislikes me or, you know, uh, if Virginia Board of Elections is filled with like these liberal progressive racists. <laughs> I don't know. Uh, maybe they watch my show, COVID-19 Update by Iraq, and they're like, I don't agree with his position. We don't want, you know, we, we, we don't want to help him in any way. I don't know what's going on there in Virginia Board of Elections. I sent letter after letter, emails, and asking them to respond to me, you know, and so uh, hopefully I'll get a letter back from them about questions that I'm asking about the election process. You know, uh, I'm new to this. Uh, and so, uh, yeah, pray for me if you're out there, uh, you know, supporting me uh, so that, you know, people in the Virginia Board of Elections will kind of respond to my letters, <laughs> you know, and just not like, <laughs> not reply for weeks and weeks. That's a little mean. <laughs> but anyway, um, I mean, there is COVID-19 going on, but as far as I know, um, Virginia Board of Election is not closed. So yeah, they should be writing, responding back to my letters and email and stuff like that. I should think, you know, and I even call them and, and they said they'll respond and I still haven't received, received any kind of letter or anything from them. So it's like, whoa, what's going on? Yeah, but anyway, may the force be with you and me. <laughs> Yeah, so, um, yeah, so, so, you know, that's why I'm running as an independent, uh, but, um, you know, it's, uh, you know, I, um, and I started this show because I know there are a lot of you out there who, who need some guidance uh, regarding COVID-19. This just struck us, struck us like out of nowhere. And some of you are probably still dazed and confused, right? Uh, and so I said, you know, what can I do for, my voters in Virginia's 8th District, Arlington, Alexandria, Falls Church, and Fairfax County. Uh, and so I said, well, I better create this show to help them understand COVID-19. Uh, I am the Leonardo da Vinci of my uh, generation of 21st century, so I could bring insights that Fox News or CNN, 
BBC, you know, Sky News, France, 24 News, Deutsche Welle cannot bring to you because, you know, their reporters are, uh, do not have the capacity that I have and the training that I have and even the experience that I have. Um, so, um, you know, so I, I felt like I need to use my, uh, you know, experience and knowledge to help voters in Virginia's 8th District, and not just voters, this is an international show. Anybody could see this show uh, through the, uh, you know, World Wide Web. So I figure I could help everybody in the world through this show. Yeah, so tell your friends, um, you know, neighbors, relatives, not just in Virginia's 8th District, but if you have relatives in Alaska, you know, North Dakota, South Dakota, and just let them know so they could see this show and that, that this show will help them because I, don't just look at the tree. I look at the all the trees and the forest, you know, and that's what you need to survive this thing. It's uh, complicated. Uh, and today we're looking at several trees uh, in different part of the forest. Uh, and so we're looking at Asia. Uh, and um, so I have top five uh, COVID-19 cases in Asia and China remains um, number one. Uh, with 83,965 cases uh, from last, uh, I guess, November to now, uh, the current time. And their total death in that period is um, 4,637. I mean, yeah, uh, those of you who've been watching my show know that my theory is that, you know, you know that China and United States are kind of like, arch rivals, right? I mean, we're both trying to, to claim the world as our domain, right? Uh, and uh, President Trump has been doing an amazing job. He, he slapped tariffs on China, slapped them around with tariffs, uh, establishing our dominance again, and our manufacturing started to grow. We were on target to become like lightning speed ahead of China in our economic dominance, and then COVID-19 hit. Uh, and my argument is that it's an intentional, uh, preemptive, next generation biological weapons of mass destruction uh, that China created, uh, and that they have, uh, they have decided to utilize against the United States of America and our NATO allies, uh, because they realize that uh, President Trump is just too great of a leader. Uh, and going at this rate, China will become second and the distance between United States and China will grow uh, to the extent that they will not be able to catch up. Uh, so I think Chinese Red Army uh, intelligence and the president, who's a great leader, by the way, I, I think he's an amazing leader, China's president. Uh, so he's kind of like China's President Trump, although I think President Trump is better than him. You know, if you go to Mano a Mano, uh, I think Mano a Mano, <laughs> uh, Luke Skywalker versus Darth Vader. And you know, President Trump is a Luke Skywalker. I don't know if you saw his uh, Team Trump sent out some tweets of uh, President uh, Trump being like a Yoda. <laughs> I think he's more like Luke Skywalker, you know? Uh, uh, so, um, but yeah, and, and I guess China's more like Darth Vader. <laughs> But anyway, you know, uh, you know, um, but Chinese president is a very bright guy. I mean, he he may be one of the best uh, presidents uh, in the communist era of uh, China, maybe better than Mao Zedong, I would say. Um, and so using his brains as a political and military leader, I think he deduced like China will not be catch up able to catch up again, because President Trump is, is creating a stronger America. Uh, and if President Trump wins again, you know, there's no way China could catch up. So China, um, you know, in, in its desperation, employed the biological weapon, uh, like what I'm calling a genetically modified virus, um, that they have already created. And they kind of made it, you know, they kind of uh, constructed a scenario to release it in a way that, it, that uh, it, you know, that where they could 
deny culpability or guilt, right? So they started in like Wuhan, which is a highly controlled environment uh, and had Chinese people die first and then start crying, you know, about the virus and the pandemic. Just to make it seem like, you know, they're victims to set the scene and then strategically release it. And I, I think they release it through, uh, you know, through their Red Army operatives. And I, my, my, my thought is that they released it into Italy first to test it and see how it's going to work. So when they saw that it was working in Italy, you know, they, they hit a target as a, as a trial run and they uh, unleashed their um, genetically modified viral weapon. That's the next generation uh, biological weapon of mass destruction. They saw that it was working in Italy. And as soon as they saw that it was working and, and all the you know, bugs been fixed, whatever bugs there were before, that could implicate China or you know, that you know, where it won't work because what's the point of releasing a biological weapon if it's not gonna work, right? But when they saw that it worked in Italy, um, they released it in New York. They targeted New York and released it in a, uh, in a, in a strategic way. Uh, and so New York became a hotspot in the same way that Italy had a hotspot. So there is an analogy there, right? The hotspot analogy. Like one area significantly faster in death rate than other areas. Um, you know, I know President Trump was going to shut down on New York and quarantine it. I still think he should have. I know uh, President Trump is um, a Democratic leader, so he deferred to Andrew Cuomo, New York governor, but I think that was a big mistake uh, because had, had uh, President Trump gone against Governor Cuomo and just quarantined New York off, uh, I, I think that would have stopped the spread throughout the rest of the 50 states. Uh, I understand why President Trump listened to Andrew Cuomo because it kind of makes you look like a dictator if you quarantine one state, right? Uh, and just makes you look bad. And um, and the governor was like, over my dead body, you know, I, I, he didn't say that, but in so many words, you know, it was like using fighting words. So President Trump really couldn't impose quarantine, which he wanted to. Uh, and that's because of Governor Cuomo. And Governor Cuomo, you know what I'm saying. Uh, so he deferred to your leadership, but I'm saying that's a mistake. Uh, and that's, I blame Andrew Cuomo. Um, unfortunately, I blame him for COVID-19 spreading all over the United States. Because if um, we shut New York off the way Italy did with the North, you know, in Italy, it started in the North, but it didn't spread to other parts of Italy, mostly, right? Because they closed off one area. Uh, and President Trump wanted to do that. You know, President Trump has, has a good instinct and he's a good leader. Every decision he's made since the start of the COVID, he shut flights from China. Every decision was a very smart decision. I guarantee you, Joe Biden and Nanda have made the same decisions. We would be in a, we would probably have a million people dead right now if Joe Biden were president right now. And you know what I'm saying. That's why you should vote for President Trump in 2020. You should thank God that Hillary wasn't president. Can you imagine what would have happened if Hillary is president? I'm talking to you Democrats out there. Can you imagine what would have happened if Hillary were president? You Democrats out there are thankful that Donald Trump is president. You know what I'm saying? You may never admit it to another living soul, but that's what you're thinking. Uh, and I said that to Democrats in Virginia's 8th district too, you're thankful that Donald Trump is president, not Hillary. But come on. I mean, you know, you might have voted for Hillary, but you're thankful Donald won. Yeah, so, um, but you know, so President Trump wanted to uh, quarantine New York off. And, uh, you know, I honestly think he shouldn't have listened to uh, Andrew Cuomo. But think of this scenario. Let's say President Trump quarantined off New York. Andrew Cuomo is going to say, oh, a dictator, a tyrant. You know, all the Democrats are gonna, in New York are going to be dictator, tyrant, right? And then let's say we don't have any spread of COVID in anywhere in America. You know, people are not going to know what we have now, right? Because if President Trump quarantined everything off in New York, we would not have these COVID cases spreading all over America, right? And we would think, oh, that's normal. That's like how it's supposed to be, right? 
so we would not have had anything to compare with had we followed President Trump's desire and quarantine New York off. We would be like Italy, where the rest of Italy is not being hurt by COVID, you know? Um, and we would have thought that's natural. But fortunately for China and its design, uh, Andrew Cuomo, you know, refused to get quarantine, have newer quarantine. Uh, and so this COVID is spreading all over America. And so, you know, I, I said, thank you, Governor Cuomo. That was a turning point in U.S. Uh, flattening the curve. Had we quarantined New York off, we probably would have flattened the curve by now. Uh, you know, I mean, we could go there from there. Like, we would be in the same situation Italy will be. You know, their death rate has significantly decreased because, like, it hasn't spread to other areas. We said quarantine one area off. Um, and I don't know where the health experts were. I have to say, Dr. Fauci, Dr. Birx, you guys all made a mistake. Um, Dr. Gottlieb, where were you guys? You should have said quarantine New York off. I mean, you, you know the principles of public health. I mean, you know, you should have quarantined that area off. I mean, it's better, it's easier to help New York if it's quarantined off, right? You could keep sending in health care workers because we don't have to fight COVID in Illinois, Michigan, Louisiana, Pennsylvania, they like all have death over like 1,000 or 2,000. Some have, you know, are heading for 3,000 or more. And, you know, by the, by the time we hit August, you know, each of these states could have over 10,000 or 20,000 deaths. And that's, I would say that's because we didn't quarantine New York off like we should have. You know, uh, so I, I blame Andrew Cuomo, the Democrat. The Democrats don't think straight. I'm telling you, they don't think straight. And that's what, you know, it is in times of crisis where you see the problems, right? President Trump has thought straight and made smart decisions every step of the way. But like, look at Andrew Cuomo. He refused to have New York quarantine, even though that was the way to stop the spread of COVID from New York to the rest of America. This is a Democrat. He, he's not thinking straight. This is why in 2020, you should vote for every Democrat, vote against every Democrat in state election, local election, state election, because Democrats are destroying this country, literally. I mean, you're seeing it right there. I mean, I'm giving you example after examples of how Democrat leaders are making fatal flaw for your, you and your family. I'm telling you, you know, Democrats are not thinking straight. They're so ideologically driven. They care so much about gay marriage, gay rights. They can't see it outside of that, you know, um, their ideology. And that's why they can't make decisions. It's like the big uh, you know, Jihari, Jihari Square uh, blind spot. You know, they can't see outside of their, you know, blind spot, you know. Uh, and that's where Andrew Cuomo is. He's, he has all these ideologies uh, that he's trying to protect even during COVID-19, even as over 20,000 New Yorkers die. He's trying to protect all these liberal progressive ideologies. He's so committed to these ideologies that he can't, he's not seeing straight. And so we had a chance to, um, to flatten the curve and, and just quarantine New York off and end this COVID and it would not have destroyed America's economy. It would not have killed all these lives. Now, you know, it's impossible to stop. It's a beyond quarantine. How are you going to quarantine every state? So when it was in New York, we should quarantine the state off. It would have stopped it. So uh, it's very unfortunate uh, that, that uh, you know, uh, President Trump allowed the Democrat governor to, uh, uh, to dictate it. But, you know, his hands were tied because, I mean, uh, Governor Cuomo was, like, talking about declaring war on the federal government. I was, like, he was talking really aggressively. I mean, he was, like, talking like a crazy guy. I just go see what the things he said when President Trump, Trump proposed quarantining New York. But I mean, I blame also Dr. Fauci, Dr. Burke, and Dr. Gottlieb for not pushing uh, President Trump to just close it down like he said he would. That's what he wanted to do. You know, because we would not be in our situation today if we didn't listen to Andrew Cuomo. But this is why you gotta vote against Democrats in 2020. And in Virginia, Vote against Mark Warner. He's a Democratic senator. 
Uh, and, uh, you know, we have a lot of good Republicans who are running in the Republican primaries. Um, and, uh, you know, uh, any one of them, whoever uh, wins will, will make better U.S. Senator the state of Virginia than Mark Warner is. So vote against the Democrats in 2020. And vote for me in Virginia's 8th district, you know, because uh, I'm the best. <laughs> best for the job in Virginia's 8th district. Um, so, um, yeah. So, so, yeah, that's where we are. I mean, you know, we should have learned our lesson from Italy and just kind of followed that quarantine procedure, which is a standard procedure in a pandemic. I don't know why we didn't follow it. I mean, President Trump wanted to follow it. And then Andrew Cuomo, the Democratic governor of New York, just kept pushing, pushing back, fighting back like a crazy man. Um, like the fighters who fight Rocky in Rocky movies, one, two, three, four. Yeah, watch Rocky movies. They're really good if you haven't seen them yet. Uh, especially the, the, the scene where he's running up the steps in the Philadelphia uh, Art Library. You know, I'm, I'm from the city of Philly. That's where I grew up. Uh, and University of Pennsylvania is very close from that, those steps. <laughs> so, um, yeah, and you know, we Koreans generally, sometimes, not always, but sometimes we have like, Easter Sunday, morning sunrise worship at 6.30 a.m. and those steps. Uh, you know, uh, yeah. So uh, I've done that a few times, you know. Uh, so all the Korean churches come together and they, like, you know, whoever is up and awake and, you know, willing to come out 6 a.m. on Easter Sunday to worship there. You know, they come out, we, we used to worship there, it's like sunrise worship. But anyway, uh, yeah. Um, so, you know, we're going to compare what's going on there. China uh, is number one. India is number two. We are talking about countries that are one billion people each, right? China is one billion plus people. India is one billion plus people. Look at the death rate, 1,566. Pakistan has total case of 20,941 and total death is 476. Singapore um, uh, we have a flag of Singapore there because it entered top five just recently, and it's 18,778 cases, but only 18 deaths. Look at that, 18 deaths. Japan has 15,078 cases, and they have 536 deaths. All of these com countries have people working in their jobs. And I think all of them have people going to school now. I think, I think they, they do. Or, you know, maybe Japan doesn't, but uh, I, don't, I think China went back to school. Yeah, I mean, like with, those, that, with that kind of death figures, I mean, it's not even a pandemic. Uh, and that's why I'm saying um, it is a precision, uh, genetically modified virus, biological weapon, a mass destruction that is advanced next generation China created that China's president decided to unleash against the United States and our allies because he did not want to become number two and have a big gap and lose his standing in the world, China's standing in the world. Uh, that makes logical sense, right? Makes logical sense to you too. And look at the figures. I'm, I'm working with data here, right? These figures, numbers don't lie. Numbers don't lie. Let the force be with you. May the force be with you. Numbers do not lie. Harry agrees. Numbers don't lie. Harry agrees. Harry, it's not a wand. It's like a flaming sword. But anyway, uh, Harry wants the flaming sword. But anyway, um, yeah, so top five cases in Asia prove my theory that this is an advanced biological weapon. The reason that I think many American politicians are not willing to agree with me is that it hurts their pride. You know, I mean, it hurt my pride as an American to come to an understanding that China beat us to the next generation biological weapon that is superior in precision. 
But you got to work with facts. So yes, it does hurt my pride to admit that their biological weapon system is like 20, 30 years ahead of our biological weapon systems. Um, but we, we focus on the internet and technology and not on bioengineering, biological weapons. Uh, and you know, genetic, genetic modification and engineering, they're like hurting for cash because all the cash is going into like internet, cyberspace, you know, cybersecurity. And you know, there's a mistake in that because you know, when you have a weakness, your enemy will exploit that weakness and that's what happened with us. And I blame NSA and I blame um, uh, Department of Homeland Security and Department of Defense, most of all, for making this weakness of ours the point of the portal of entry for COVID-19. You know, without a weakness, without portal of entry, virus cannot come in and infect you. And uh, Department of Defense, NSA, and Homeland Security made our weakness in biological warfare a big portal of entry for COVID-19 to come in and destroy us. And thanks to Andrew Cuomo, the New Yorker, not allowing us to quarantine New York off, now the whole country is going to head toward destruction. You know, people's lives are going to be lost. The economy is going to be collapsing in every state. Um, you know, uh, this thing is going to continue at least two years. And if you see uh, Face the Nation uh, with Dr. Gottlieb interviewed um, uh, Margaret Brennan uh, last Sunday, uh, you know, he, he's actually coming to my position that he thinks that this may be a continuous, uh, continuous um, infection and not a cycle. You know how since the very beginning I said COVID-19 is not a flu. It's not going to go through a cycle, like go up and then go down. And I say it's just going to continue continuously. Um, and, um, you know, it seems like it's holding true. And Dr. Gottlieb kind of admitted that that could be the case. And he said there's a high, high likelihood that our new normal is 1,000 to 2,000 deaths per day. Uh, it may go up, and you know, if uh, people don't, aren't careful uh, guarding against infection. But so he seems to be coming around to my position that it's not a cyclical of, you know, flu-like uh, seasonal uh, thing, but it's just a continuous thing. Um, and um, so, you know, I'm being proved right every turn right now. If you see my show from the very beginning to now, everything I said is coming true. So, because I'm the Leonardo da Vinci of the 21st century, obviously I could predict things using uh, data uh, and using the methodology. I use interdisciplinary approach solving problems and uh, so they call me the hero at the problem solver and so i'm trying to solve the the mystery of covid19 and so uh you're in that journey with me um but yeah so um yeah continue watching subscribe to my youtube channel watch every day tell all your friends family relatives co-workers to watch every day uh so that you can get a perspective on covid that is not provided by fox news uh, or CNN, or BBC, Sky News, Deutsche Welle, France 24, you know, any other news in the world, KBS Korea. Um, yeah, so, uh, and if you're a reporter, obviously you want to watch my show religiously because you need ideas for your reporting. Um, yeah, so I'm going to try to help you and your family survive COVID-19, so keep watching this show. Now, uh, it is Cinco de Mayo, Cinco de Mayo, Cinco de Mayo. Yeah, actually Cinco de Mayo is uh, tomorrow, the May 5th. Uh, so this is Cinco de Mayo Eve. And I was just going to end the celebration yesterday, which was the end of the weekend. But nobody's going to work now because of uh, COVID-19. So I said, hey, we could extend the Cinco de Mayo celebration into work day. Uh, and so here we are. So. In the spirit of celebration of Cinco de Mayo, I have some more photos for you. Uh, and you see, I'm wearing the shirt that I wore uh, in the photos. And the photos are from uh, 
Cambridge University. As you know, I'm the vice president of uh, Georgetown University graduate student government. It's called GradGov. Uh, and uh, for academic year 2019 to 2020, I was elected in March, April of 2019, and I've been uh, vice president, you know, since then. Uh, and uh, we threw some, some fun parties and events uh, uh, at Georgetown. Uh, and uh, uh, you can see all the fun, uh, you know, Facebook photos uh, on those events. Um, and so, um, yeah, so, um, you know, um, um, and so, so you know, I, I tried to make the lives of Georgetown graduate students better. Uh, and we have 9,000 students, uh, you know, some of them are Republican, although we have more Democrats. Uh, I think everybody in uh, GradCov executive board is like Democrats. <laughs> I'm the, I'm, I think I'm the only Republican. But anyway, um, well, you know, I'm independent now, but conservative, politically conservative person, you know. Uh, but uh, yeah, it's only recent that I'm independent. <laughs> so, so, you know, I, I, when I was elected, I was Republican. I was re re Republican until like, you know, March, <laughs> when, when the deadline for filing for a Republican convention, you know, was there, you know, uh, uh, yeah. So, um, yeah, but anyway, um, so I'm the vice president of uh, Georgetown uh, Graduate Student Government. Hello, all the graduate students at Georgetown University. As your vice president, I'd like to congratulate everybody who's graduating from Georgetown University uh, in May 2020. Uh, I hope you go on and do great things. Um, yeah, and I hope uh, you'll respect the First Amendment. You know, that's my big issue uh, as a uh, candidate for U.S. Congress, independent candidate for U.S. Congress. I am arguing for um, a respecting of uh, religion re and political views and freedom of speech. Uh, and so, yeah, so, so I practiced that uh, in my show, um, COVID Update by Hirak, as well as on my Twitter account, uh, which is protected by the First Amendment, freedom of speech, freedom of religion, freedom of political position. Yeah, it's, it's protected. <laughs> so I hope every one of you 9,000 Georgetown graduate uh, university uh, students will respect the First Amendment uh, and respect the First Amendment, you know, uh, in the United States. Well, anyway, that's my signature issue. So if you agree with me, vote for me. <laughs> Doesn't matter what party you're in. Um, actually, there's a freedom, free speech. I think it's called Free Speech Project at Georgetown. Small group of people who are trying to stand up for uh, freedom of speech, the First Amendment. Yeah. So uh, yeah, there's little sparks everywhere trying to fight for freedom of speech. Yeah. Um, so, um, you know, I, I have been an activist in the university setting. And you know, as you know, Georgetown University is very liberal. For me as a conservative, uh, politically conservative, religiously evangelical Christian who, who oppose gay marriage and abortion, I mean, it's the official position of the Catholic Church, and Georgetown University is a Catholic university, so technically, it's the official position of Georgetown University to oppose gay marriage and, and oppose abortion. Um, you know, so, but, but you know, the, a lot of the, the graduate students are in the Democratic Party, uh, and so I think majority are. So for me to become vice president, you, you know, it, it you know, says a lot about my leadership, right? Um, and my character. Uh, and so um, I've been in liberal universities and I've been very active in, in uh, student activity. Uh, and so uh, when I was at uh, Cambridge University, I actually ran for university-wide election. It was like 20 to 30,000 students voting, right? And I ran as an, uh, to be an academic officer. So uh, I, I campaigned and I, I ran and I won. Yes, I won. I got the votes of all those English people to vote for me. So I became an academic officer. We made this shirt, you know, and actually I became an academic officer for Kusu International, which is a division of Cambridge University Student Union, which is the student government at, uh, at uh, Cambridge University, uh, which is concerned with international students. Uh, so we made this shirt, Kusu International shirt. Uh, 
And I just want to do a shout out because, <laughs> uh, you know, uh, our executive board was very great. Uh, so uh, Anna May Ku uh, from Hong Kong is right there in the center in the red jacket next to me. Uh, she's beautiful inside and out. Uh, and I think she was like, she was like 19. Yeah, that's like when she was 19. Um, she was, uh, everybody there is, uh, there are undergraduates. I'm the only one who, who, uh, who was doing doctoral level research uh, at Cambridge University. <laughs> I mingle well with undergraduates. Undergraduates love me wherever I go. I go. I'm like groupies everywhere. <laughs> I have groupies at uh, Cambridge University. Did you know that I got voted in as the um, one of 20 quintessential uh, Cambridge University student? Yes. I was the only Asian out of 20 who was elected. Everyone else was like white. I had, most of them were like, you know, <laughs> the royalty and like lords from, from all over Europe. Because, you know, Cambridge University brings together a lot of royalty and nobility. And, uh, you know, I dated, you know, a few royals and nobles. You know, maybe I'll share that with you some other time. But, uh, yeah, so I was very popular with the women. Uh, and men, you know, men wanted to be like me, you know, uh, because, <laughs> and women wanted to date me. So, <laughs> so that's why, I mean, I was popular with guys because they're like, oh, he's like, you know. Is alpha male, you know, and women want to date me. So I dated some of, some, uh, I went on dates with some of the, the most, I mean, actually, I think I, I went on date with all the most beautiful women at, uh, at Cambridge University, literally. I mean, I'm not joking. Um, yeah, I mean, yeah, I'm just, you know, I'm, I'm single even now. I, I'm hoping God will send me somebody to marry, uh, start a family. <laughs> I mean, I've been praying for that, you know, but I mean, you can't decide this on your own, right? So, uh, you know, in Cambridge, you know, um, you know, I dated because I want to find the love of my life, obviously. So what I did is like the most beautiful women in Cambridge that I saw, I ran in, I, I might not have ran into, but I was like within, you know, like a block's length. You know, I made a point to go and ask them out. And so, um, they generally said yes. I don't remember anybody saying no. I, I don't know why, you know? I don't understand why beautiful women say yes to me when I ask them out on a date. I mean, I, I still don't understand. It's like a, one of the big mysteries of life. Anyway, I'm not gonna start thinking about it because I, 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 I can't begin to think about answers to that. But yeah, so, so I, uh, yeah. So, so there was this one royal that I dated for a while. Uh, and I was like hoping I'll get married to her, but, but uh, you know, she was like, I met her when she was like um, 18. So she was like a freshman uh, at Cambridge University. She's like royal from what I understood. Um, like Scottish royal blood and Italian royal blood. I think she's from the Medici line from the Italian side and Scottish like, you know, royal blood for for a long time. So she's like ancient blue blood, like an ideal person, even among the royals to like marry. Yeah, so, and you know, I kind of went on dates with her. I was hoping things would work out, <laughs> but uh, unfortunately it did not. If it worked out, obviously I would have married her. I would, I would probably be teaching Jewish studies at Cambridge University. And then, um, you know, going to her grandfather's castle in Edinburgh. Um, yeah, and then I think she's like a countess. But anyway, I don't know like what I would be called if I ended up marrying her. <laughs> but, uh, but yeah, anyway, uh, yeah, she was she's beautiful. You know, she she's uh, like six foot four, six foot two, maybe. She's like this much taller than me. Like she's... I don't know, she was much taller than me because I always had to look up. She was always taller than me and that's why she wasn't wearing high heels. Yeah, we went to the same church, St. Andrews the Great. And she was like an usher there. And uh, yeah, mm. yeah, I'm like having tears in my eyes now. Anyway, uh, no, it's actually not tears. I think there's dust particles. But uh, anyway, um, yeah. 
So it didn't work out. I didn't get to marry a countess and a royalty. Ah, uh, well, what can I do? Life is like that. But lucky for you, now I'm running to be your congressman. If I marry the countess and settle down with the title in Europe, teaching at Cambridge University, Jewish studies at Cambridge University, I might have been happy, but, you know, especially with my wife, uh, she's beautiful. Um, and she was like, she was like six foot two and like 100 pounds, 110 pounds. I mean, she, I, I, yeah, I think she might have been like 100 pounds, 110 pounds. She's like, she's perfect. Like, she's beautiful. She had like blue eyes. Uh, she, you know, uh, you know, she had long hair, flowing hair. She was like six foot two, like 100, 110 pounds. Like, she's, oh yeah, she, she really, you know, she looked really good. But um, I'm, a, I'm, you know, I'm a heterosexual single guy. What can I say? You know? So, uh, yeah, I appreciate beauty. Uh, God created beauty. And when Adam saw Eve for the first time, he's like, here's bone on my bones, flesh on my flesh. You know, I mean, you know, in the Bible, they always talk about beauty before anything else. So I don't apologize for appreciating uh, beauty in women, beautiful women. I mean, I, you know, but uh, anyway, um, you know, I just to tell you the story a little bit further. Uh, sorry for like indulging, you know, indulge. I don't know if you want to hear this. If, if you get bored, just turn this off. But you know, I met her. Ah. Ah. Yeah, I, uh, I walked into the library, in the history department. Uh, because, you know, I, I, you know, research Jewish history, so I go to Jewish history department, I use library and, uh, you know, Near Eastern languages and cultures, the faculty of divinity, theology department, you know, I used, and the universal library, obviously. So I went into the history department, you know, to do some research into Jewish studies. And uh, as soon as I entered, I looked across the library, the main hallway, there was like this beautiful woman sitting there. I was like, wow, she's so beautiful. So I said, uh, you know, I, uh, I mean, I, I, I have to meet her. So I, uh, so I, I walked over, you know, and she probably don't know that I noticed her from far away and I walked all the way there, you know, but this is how guys, you know, guys, when they see a beautiful woman from far away, they pretend like they, you know, they were just kind of headed there anyway, you know. But uh, you guys know what I mean out there. Uh, so, um, yeah, so I, I didn't go directly, obviously, because I was in the front entrance. I just kind of like walked around looking at the books. And then eventually I um, went, went and sat down. <laughs> I sat down right in front of her. I guess I should have sat a little bit far away, but I mean, it's a library. If I'm going to talk to her, if I, you know, I may have to put this hat down for a little bit. Uh, if I if I want to talk to her, you know, if I want to talk to uh, to her, um, you know, I, I would. I mean, I, I can't talk to her if I'm far away. So, you know, I have to think like, you know, I, I want to meet her. That's the whole point. Why I'm like sitting near her. I don't want to be sitting like a, a table away. In which case, in the library, there's like no way you can talk to her. So. So I sat down right in front of her. She was studying alone. Uh, and, um, you know, I was working. And then she, she kind of looked up and looked at me. And I'm like, oh. I looked up and looked at her. I smiled. And she smiled back. And I said, geez, I'm not going to let this opportunity go. She's like, beautiful. You know, so um, I said, uh, hi. Um, you know, my name is Hira. Uh, actually, I better use my middle name, Christian, because, you know, my first name is hard to pronounce, Iraq, so I kind of went by my middle name, Christian. So my name's Christian, um, you know, uh, and, uh, you know, and then we start talking, you know, I don't, it's kind of a phase, but she's beautiful, so I was kind of numb, and I was kind of like in an auto zone. I don't remember what I said, but, you know, you, you know, I mean, guys, you, know, you guys know what I mean, like, if you, you see, like, a woman was, like, amazing and beautiful, and you start talking to the you're not quite sure what you're saying, and you don't remember what you said really afterwards. So, so it's, you're kind of in a state of kind of nervous shock, you know. Sympathetic nervous system is like working, you know, you know, fight or flight. It's like, do I run or do I stay? You know, I, I <laughs> yeah. But anyway, so 
So I'm talking to her and I, and, and I, you know, I don't know what I exactly said, but she started laughing and stuff like that. So I said, hey, you know, um, do you want to, you know, grab lunch together sometime, you know, and get to talk, you know, talk to each other a little bit more because there's a library, you know, I kind of have to go and have an appointment. Um, so she's like, yeah. And so she wrote down her name and her email address, the phone number, gave it to me. So I, so I contacted her and that's you know, how we started. And, um, you know, you know, I asked, I asked her like, you know, what's your, what do you, you know, you, you know, what, are you a history major? And she's like, yeah. And I said, you know, uh, so, um, so I found out she was a first year student. So I think she was like 18. Um, but you know, she's an adult, you know, anybody over 18 is an adult, right? Um, so, um, yeah, so, you know, I asked her, you know, I was younger then obviously too, but I was, well, you know, older than her. Um, so, so, you know, we went out on date and then, um, I found out later that we went to the same church, you know, which is, I mean, the church had like 1,500 Cambridge University students. But uh, yeah, I mean, she's beautiful. And then I found out later that she was like a royal, you know, like a countess type of person. Um, yeah, so, um, but yeah, she, I, I went and talked to her just because she was amazing and beautiful. I didn't know anything else about her. But yeah, so, so you know, I, um, so, you know, I mean, yeah, so 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 I think it's the women that I have dated at Cambridge University who nominated me uh, for to be one of the twenty quintessential Cambridge students because I'm like an American, like Korean American, and I don't look anything like a model, and like everyone in the photo look like a model. I, I I kid you not, they all look like they're all like nobility billionaires from Europe. Uh, they're all white, um, billionaires from, oh, yeah, there's, I think, a billionaire from South Africa. Uh, you know, they're all like these, either they were nobles with titles or billionaires or something, you know, and they're like 20 quintessential Cambridge students, you know, were like popular and it people. I, I, I obviously, I was popular, <laughs> you know, uh, but, uh, yeah, but I, you know, I I don't have a title. I'm not a billionaire. You know what? Can I, I you know that's so. And I don't know like a model. Every single one of them look like a model. I mean, I'm like they're like rich, have titles. They look like models. What's wrong with these people? You know. But hey, I I couldn't complain because you know um, I enjoy dating them. <laughs> you know. So, uh, but anyway, uh, so there are 20 quintessential, you know, Cambridge University students. Uh, and I got included, and I think I was like the oldest punch. I think everybody was like between like 18 to 22, and I was above that. I'm like, how did I get in? Yeah, it was in the, the Cambridge student newspaper. And like, I picked up a copy and like, whoa, I'm like one of the 20 quintessential Cambridge University students. Whoa. But anyway, yeah, I, people like me a lot, and, and beautiful women say yes to me for some reason, you know? and. So, um, you know, for dates. So anyway, yeah. Oh, but anyway, uh, you guys just, you know, kind of going down the memory lane. But how do we get into this topic? Uh, <laughs> but yeah, oh yeah, I ran, I ran for uh, academic officer of Cambridge University Student Union, and I won, um, got the votes so, uh, yeah, out of the 20,000. And I'm, I'm yeah, student activism is very important to me because I want to help other students. And, uh, um, you know, um, yeah, so I ran and I won. And so, you know, and I ran for the, to be, to work with international students because I really care about international students. I'm an international student and I wanted to advocate for them and, and kind of take care of them, you know. Um, because English students, they, they know it's their country. They don't need anybody to take care of them, right? So I want to take care of international students. So I worked, um, you know, with uh, my fellow uh, uh, officers. So Anna May Koo is the one right in the center, uh, middle. She's from Hong Kong. Her father is great. I met her father, uh, came over from Hong Kong. Uh, businessman, uh, Hong Kong businessman, uh, very influential, powerful in Hong Kong. Um, hopefully, I mean, yeah, nobody's dying from COVID in Hong Kong, sorry. I mean, I was going to say, 
hopefully he's okay, but I mean, that's like a new good issue because nobody's dying in Hong Kong in COVID. Um, and next to her is uh, Dear Meta. And he's not, oh yeah, that, Dear Meta is in the end. Uh, next to him is uh, Andy Pang. And he's from Singapore. And he was in the Singaporean army. Uh, like, I forgot his rank. Uh, and so I think it's a mandatory military service in Singapore. So, I, I mean, it's not like he's much older than others. I think he served like two or three years. Whatever the mandatory uh, uh, years uh, you have to serve in the army. It's like Israel, you have to serve three years from 18 to 21 if you're male, 18 to 20 if you're female. And uh, I think Singapore has mandatory military service as well. So he served in the military and then he came over to Cambridge for his undergraduate studies. Uh, and next to him um, uh, is uh, Tir Mehta, uh, and I think he's like a Brahmin from uh, India. His father's a very powerful guy there. Um, and um, yeah, and on the other side of my, uh, on the other, other side, my left side uh, is, uh, Shan Yi Fok uh, from uh, Hong Kong. And I think she was like a billionaire from Hong Kong. I think that's what uh, Andy told me. But anyway, um, yeah, I mean, a lot of Asians uh, at Cambridge were like billionaires. Like they're like, I don't know if you, I don't know if you saw the movie Crazy Rich Asians, uh, but for some reason, a lot of Asians in Cambridge were like billionaires. Like you had these billionaires from Hong Kong and Singapore. Yeah, so a lot, you know, there was a lot of them. Um, anyway, you know, they're fun to hang out with. Uh, unfortunately, Leah Al wasn't there. and She's from Singapore. She's, I think she was a billionaire too. Uh, she threw a really great party. It was really fun. Uh, really nice Christian, uh, devout evangelical Christian. Uh, but unfortunately, she's not in the photo. But um, yeah, um, so you see the photo of uh, you know our uh, you know uh, orientation uh, week uh, when we try to like introduce everybody to different clubs at, uh, at Cambridge University, uh, and also I did some fundraising to raise money for these shirts, <laughs> so we could give out these shirts for free uh, to all the international students, um, and so I. I uh, went around like small businesses near Cambridge University raising money. So I went to, uh, to Subway and met the owner. Uh, you see the photo like on the bottom? Uh, and he, he said he'll donate money. So he donated money to, to us for these shirts. Uh, so I took a photo with him. And um, oh, uh, on the other side on the bottom, you have uh, uh, Mai Yasuhara, and she's from Japan. My Yashuhara. Uh, and, you know, we, I mean, all of us were really close friends. Uh, you know, and we worked uh, one year throughout the whole year trying to help international students. And uh, uh, we worked on the international student visa issue. The labor government, British labor government, was uh, trying to raise uh, visa fees for international students. So we fought that. And we, we, we had. We did like a whole national activism with England, Scotland, Wales, and Northern Ireland. And uh, yeah, so we did some serious stuff. <laughs> Finally, the labor government tried to raise these visa fees for um, international students. It was unfair, I thought. I mean, they doubled the visa fees. Who does that? And labor government is supposed to be like a liberal government. You know, but anyway, um, and most of the, the people in the executive board uh, were labor, you know, and uh, but you know they 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 fought against the visa hike, um, you know. So uh, but yeah, um, so uh, and also you know uh, uh, yeah I'm friendly so I, I say hello to everybody. So uh, during one uh, one World Week, uh, Warwick University, I met some uh, uh, university uh, executive board members from War War Warwick University in England. Uh, Warwick University is where they had the One world, world Week, which brought together all the universities to celebrate the world. Uh, and so I went there and, um, you know, I just made friends with executive board members from Warwick. Um, 
but anyway, yeah. So uh, yeah, so so I'm a legend in, in Cambridge University. People, <laughs> people, you know, like, I mean, you know how hard it is to be voted in as the quintessential Cambridge University student. Twenty spots. That's all there is for like over twenty thousand students, and only people who get voted in are like billionaires. And you have to be beautiful. You can't be like a billionaire who's fat and ugly. You have to be like a beautiful model-looking billionaire, or you didn't get in. I'm serious. I mean, there's so many billionaires in Cambridge, right? So I mean, it's like a dime in a dozen. Um, so, so you have to, in order to be one of the twenty. I mean, you, it's a fierce competition. You have royalty from every country in Europe. I mean, literally from every country in Europe, right? So you could say I'm a royal, but I mean, yeah. I mean, how about the other guy over there? How about that girl? You know, she's princess of that, you know. And so, uh, you know, to be like in that twelve, you have to like have a title, and you have to be like beautiful, and you have to be kind of like have kind of, you know, leadership skills within the elites, <laughs> you know, in Cambridge. And I, I mean, obviously, I dominated. <laughs> I dominated all the royalty and nobility. I. I was an alpha male. I mean, like all these beautiful royalty women, like Germany, Norway, Spain. I mean, I went out on dates. You know, I, anyway, I don't want to talk too much about it, but I do. I, I, I do want to talk about it because they're really beautiful. And, um, and I'm single, you know, and hopefully God will, you know, send me somebody, <laughs> you know, like, like her. <laughs> but uh, yeah. Anyway, you know, whatever happens, you know, I'm open, you know. Uh, uh, it's, I guess, you know, it's like COVID-19. COVID-19 sets the timeline, not you. It's like love sets the timeline, not you. <laughs> so, yeah, anyway. Uh, yeah, anyone out there who's beautiful, you know, uh, have a royal title or, you know, is a billionaire <laughs> and looks like a model, <laughs> give me a call. I'm just joking. I'm just joking. I just want a really good Christian person who loves the Lord. But anyway, um, yeah. Uh, so, uh, you know, today's Cinco de Mayo. So I, I thought I'd cheer you up with some of, of my uh, photos uh, from, from my uh, Cambridge University uh, uh, elected official days. <laughs> so I'm, I've been an elected official in like different settings, but... Uh, this is like first time I'm running for like political office at the national level, U.S. Congress, Virginia State District. So vote for me on November um, uh, 3rd, 2020. I'm running against Don Byer, who's the current congressman in this area. Uh, so just look for my name, Hirak. Hirak, yeah. So yeah, and you can see the spelling of my name there. Uh, so yeah, it's, uh, it's Korean name is Joy and Happiness, and you see how Joy and Happiness how joyful and happy I am. <laughs> so the name is a uh, is, uh, perfect name for me. So uh, I hope you enjoy this show. Uh, and I hope I, I provide you with some information that can help you uh, survive COVID-19 and thrive during this time. Um, I hope that you will come back tomorrow. We have a fun and exciting show for tomorrow as well. So I hope that you will be well and that your family will be well as well. And uh, see you tomorrow. Bye.